Hi, I'm Valerie Shangro, Director of the Blandin Foundation Leadership Programs. I'd like to take a minute to introduce the video you're about to see. We're excited about this video for a number of reasons. In this video, you'll hear about the very real challenges, disappointments, and successes from someone who has first-hand experience leading a community to valuing people for their differences and striving to include all segments of the population into community life and leadership. We hear from a community leader who reminds us of the possibilities that exist through patience, persistence, and a passion for community. I'm the mayor of Wilmer, Minnesota, and I've been mayor here for 14 years. The issue of diversity and helping uh, our community grow with diversity uh, was not a planned kind of journey. Uh, it was a sequence, a series of events uh, that came before us that we had to handle and do some significant problem solving. Diversity and building inclusivity it will be the task of every community, whether it's a village, a town, or a city in Minnesota in the years ahead. And so we have to anticipate that to get ready for that. In fact, we have heard uh, Tom Gillespie, the state demographer, talk uh, here in Wilmer and in state meetings that if people in Minnesota want to know how Minnesota is growing and evolving uh, and what Minnesota will look like by the year 2020, they should come out to Wilmer now and look at what Wilmer is today because that's what Wilmer is going to earn, what the state of Minnesota will look like by the year 2020. Nowadays, the immigrants are of different colors and less of them speak English when they arrive. And so there is a, a, a certain difficulty in them uh, arriving and integrating and becoming part of the community. When new people come to the community, there's, there's an anxiety. You know, what's all this change going on? Are they safe? You know, I don't know these people. They don't speak my language. What are they really saying? And they're, I think there's a conclusion that, or an assumption that people jump to, well, they're, they're going to cost us more money. They're going to use our social services system. Uh, they're going to use our emergency uh, ward services at the hospital. And they're just kind of drawing off the community. What are they really contributing? That's one of kind of the, the, the central principles of discouragement or you know, non-acceptance is they're just, they're just drawing off of us. Every community, whether it's a neighborhood or a city or a region, when you're faced with change, it uh, can make people anxious or nervous or fearful unless they understand and know what's going on and see it as an opportunity. Rather than trying to control it and prevent it, I think we have to get out in front of it and see it as an opportunity and how can we lead this integration to become part or to how can we take this diversity and make it an integral part of our community and make the community stronger build it into this tapestry that is our community well, some people look at it as challenges or problems and I mean you can choose to look at, the, at it that way but I choose to look at it as opportunities and assets because we need people of all uh, diversity to come to Minnesota for a variety of reasons. One is very simply the workforce in Minnesota. Uh, our Caucasian population is beginning to age out. The other thing that happens is our schools. Uh, here in Wilmer, we have about, I think it's about 4,700 kids in the Wilmer School District. And we've been able to hold our school population fairly steady because of the influence of children of diversity. We only had three minority-owned businesses in the city of Wilmer just three years ago. We now have, at this time, 37 minority-owned businesses in the city of Wilmer. And so we've grown from three to 37 in just about three years. Now these are small businesses. They, you know, oftentimes they only have one or two or three employees, but the benefit is that they are leasing and sometimes owning property. 
They are hiring local people. They are buying their supplies locally and spending locally. And they're beginning to shape and turn that whole assumption that people are only here to draw off the community. They are now paying taxes. They are you know, paying their mortgages. They are shopping locally. The financial impact of minorities in the city of Wilmer, uh, what they spend and what they earn and what they revolve in terms of the dollar turning over, is in the range of 70 to 80 million dollars per year. Now our whole economic activity in the city of Wilmer is about 550 million dollars per year. So 80 million of that comes from our minority population. That is significant. That is a lot of taxes. That is a lot of supply. That is a lot of economy that I'm very happy is going on in our community. I think any mayor would say that. We made some mistakes. We were eager to step forward, you know, jump in and say, okay, we're gonna, this is in the 90s. And the first thing we did is we called a meeting. In fact, we called many meetings. And we invited, you know, people to come because we were gonna talk about diversity and how we were gonna accept change and, and uh, integrate everything. Well, guess what? The only people that came to the meetings were Caucasians and you know the the heart and soul of the community the the bankers and the ministers and the people from city hall we all showed up and no people of diversity showed up they didn't feel comfortable they didn't feel welcome they felt like they were they would be preached at or talked at so we had to step back and say now what what are we doing here we're trying to solve new opportunities and new challenges with old methods that worked when everybody is more heterogeneous but doesn't work when people are more diverse. So we had to step back and say, okay, let's, let's look at this differently. And with then what we did was to begin to think about the youth, the children. Because children, we found and we know, are more flexible. They're more um, malleable. They, they like creativity. They like ideas. And so we would call gatherings of children together and say, what do you think of this town and how can we make this better? And they wanted things. They wanted soccer. And they wanted homework clubs. And they wanted people to help them with their language. And they wanted places to make friends. And one of the first programs we ever started that I'm so proud of was a little program called Amigos de Cristos. It was started with a partnership between city interns, who were primarily college students, uh, churches who provided volunteers and transportation, using our city parks, it was a summer program, kind of like what we now call day camps. And we would gather together uh, local children and children of diversity who were relatively the same age, 30 or 40 kids at a time, 20 from each side. And over the course of the summer, we'd have five or six weeks of what we called these day camps, or the name was Amigos de Cristos. And at the end of, the, at the end of these camps, what we expected and what we found was that these kids had formed friendships. They had gotten to know kids they didn't know and then when the school year started in the fall they had a friend or a couple of friends or three friends that they entered the school with and it worked. The children became comfortable with each other. They got to know each other. Sometimes they would go back and forth to each other's homes and play and so when the children became comfortable, the children taught the adults to become comfortable. Another problem we had was that we thought we needed to get uh, police officers who were bilingual because then they could speak Spanish, you know, and that was the primary group of diversity uh, in our community. And so we had a police chief in those years who was gung-ho about getting a bilingual officer. So he rushed down to El Paso, Texas and recruited some deputy down there who wanted to move and he came up here and he did speak Spanish. Well, he didn't do a very good job of screening the fellow and the, the fellow wound up being somewhat problematic. But that was a case of moving too fast and expecting that we had the answer before we had really researched it. And communities do that. They think they know what they should do without really listening to the people and finding out, is that what we need most? So that was one of our mistakes. We hired bilingual pa people too fast without using our local people first and listening to what the people of diversity really thought was needed. Soccer has been one of our major successes. Soccer is a activity of diversity.
what we did then was uh, talk to the kids and find out, well, what ages need soccer? And they said, all ages. We have elementary kids that want to play soccer, and we have high school kids, and we have young adults. We went from like four or five soccer teams now to almost 30 soccer teams. And it's become a huge success, and it's at all ages. And in fact, one of our, uh, our largest employer here in town, Jenny L. Turkey Store, believed in it so much that they donated a hundred and twenty thousand dollars if the city would build a soccer complex that would be reserved only for soccer and not be used for football because football chews up the, the grass and it's not as uh, compatible with soccer. So the city uh, took, uh, thanked them for a donation of $120,000. We added $80,000 to it, came up with a $200,000 project. And when you look out on the soccer field and you see who's playing, you got Somalis playing with Latinos, playing with uh, Asians, playing with Ameri you know, Caucasian Americans. And you know, it's, a, it's a field of diversity, and they love it. How do you um, help the community move forward with acceptance? I think it comes by looking at what are the assets of minority people. We used to be, you know, northern European kind of minority uh, populations. Now we know that we have at least 35 to 37 different cultures represented here in Wilmer. A couple of ways to respond to this. One is um, I'm very proud of Wilmer because of its strong church involvement. We have 36 different churches in the city of Wilmer. And the, the churches are very good at promoting community service efforts, uh, teaching you know, the, the, uh, the underpinnings of the Christian religion and now this, you know, the Muslim religion, um, about uh, helping each other, taking care of each other, you know, showing respect for each other. Um, it, it really helps create an environment of acceptance and, and reaching out. We did work hard now to establish what's called a Somali Community Center here in Wilmer. And it's located right in the downtown uh, Central Business District uh, at, at the end of one of our main blocks of businesses. And they have a, a, a two-story community center down there. And in that center, they have uh, some offices for the director and his interns. They have a mosque, which is a large classroom size where they teach their religion classes and have their prayer sessions. The second thing is the children of minority who help to stabilize school systems at all levels, elementary, middle school, uh, senior high, and college, college level. We need to reinforce that, support that, find ways to keep kids in high school to graduate and encourage them to go on to college so that they get basic training and make themselves marketable. And they have improved the graduation rate significantly, um, mainly by working with the parents. They, uh, they schedule parent-teacher conferences like every school district does, but they have found a way to actually go to the businesses where they work, pick up the parents, bring them to the uh, parent-teacher conferences for their half-hour meeting, take them back to their work site. And the businesses are very cooperative with that, uh, we've been able to secure some funding to provide the transportation for that, and it has significantly raised the idea of kids staying in school, being accountable, and has raised the, uh, uh, the graduation rate significantly. Understanding diversity, working with diversity, and integrating it, building inclusivity in your city takes time, sometimes generations of time. And sometimes we expect to solve a problem faster than it can be solved. We are not experts in this field. We have to go and study about these cultures, study you know, and learn you know, the influence of family life that might be different in their culture than it is in our culture. Um, get ourselves educated through seminars and workshops and training programs, just like the people in this Blandon program are doing. Uh, they should be commended and supported for spending their time to become more educated about issues of diversity. Examine your own biases. Examine, you know, where am I somewhat limited in my attitudes? Uh, and do I need to address those in some manner? The veneer of acceptance is very thin sometimes. Yes, you know, we believe in, you know, helping everybody. Yes, we believe in um, um, helping people gain a better life. Just don't live in my neighborhood. Don't live next to me. 
you know, that veneer, you know, can, can uh, be very thin about acceptance and goodwill and all that until it, until they, it in, infringes on your own personal space. A lot of people have bias and a lot of people have bigotry that they don't admit to. And when you talk about it, they become very defensive. Leadership um, requires courage and it requires patience and it requires some risk. But it comes back to what, what does a community need to do to make itself healthier and stronger and um, more informed and to reduce the problems of bigotry and racism and bias. That's what I refer to as taking the higher ground. The higher ground is showing respect, building allies, recognizing that every person has dignity, and uh, helping them step forward. And one of the concepts in working with diversity, I believe, is building allies. That people of diversity, you know, they, they have less assets than we do who've been here for decades. But with a little bit of help and with some alliance from people in the community, they can step forward. And they can, make, they can find a way to be successful. So we have to work at building allies for people of diversity. It's not always easy. It takes courage. Um, and you'll be criticized. Um, leaders uh, are not always supported for what they think is the way to go. The other principle that I work with and I think cities can work with is this idea of anticipating uh, concerns. Uh, in Minnesota, hockey is a wonderful uh, sport. Everybody, or everybody knows somebody who plays hockey. They say every kid is born with a hockey stick. I don't know. But there's a, a great player who is now retired named Wayne Gretzky. And he used to talk about the fact that a good hockey player is one who can catch the puck on the blade of their stick and pass it back and forth and skate with it back and forward and finally shoot it in the net. That's a good hockey player. But a great hockey player is one who skates to where the puck is going to be. They race ahead down the ice and they anticipate the direction of the puck or they wait for the puck to be passed to them in advance and they skate to it. And with that momentum, they carry it down the ice and they slap it home for a goal. That's a great hockey player. And I think that's what our task is as leaders, is to be a great hockey player, a great leader, by anticipating what the concerns and the issues are in your community and stay out in front of them. Talk about it, study it, gather others into discussion, listen to the concerns, and then responsibly plan to address the concerns. And take your time. The problems will be there, the opportunities will be there. Don't rush too fast that you overwhelm the situation, but bring people with you and see it as a partnership approach to solving whatever the issues are and to building inclusivity and building integration in your community. Uh, the issues of diversity, um, I think once you experience it, you know, I tell people, don't be frightened. You know, this is not difficult. These are people, these are families. They will fit into your neighborhoods. They will fit into your schools. Their children are okay to play with. You know, give them time and give yourself some time and see this as a long-term kind of, of effort, not just it's gotta get, you know, something has to change this week. Be patient with this. Les will be the first to acknowledge that moving toward a healthier community is an ongoing process one in which perfection is never achieved. My hope is that you'll be encouraged by the difference one leader can make in building a healthier community for generations to come.